I'd like to thank Carl and Bailey for providing all the cheese we're going to enjoy later on. Uh, Saki's pastry for the pastries. I'd like to thank the uh, Iran Armenian Society for donating this hall for it. Their minimum fee, just clean fee. Appreciate that too. I'd like to thank the staff executive committee members who worked with me to put this plan together. And most importantly, thank you for your presence. Uh, before we get on with the, uh, the topic of the day and introduce the speaker, let me say a few words about SARF, uh, even though most of you know already. SARF uh, is an organization that operates in Southern California. We raise money for Syrian Armenian refugees. Uh, the bulk of the money has gone to Armenians who live in Syria and in one occasion this year we send it to Syrian Armenians who live in Yerevan as part of the Oxfam subsidy, a subsidy for housing basically in Yerevan. But for all intents and purposes the money that we have raised so far has gone to Armenians that live in Syria. And as you know, South donations, donations to South are always tax exempt. Um, Syria uh, is a country that has been a host for the refugees of the genocide, as you all know. So we as Armenians, we are thankful to the uh, people of, of that region for hosting us, for giving us a chance to get our act together, to recoup, and even prosper for that matter. We're sorry to see Syria, and the Middle East for that matter, in such turmoil. It really saddens us. But there are many reasons for that. There are superpowers who are fighting for resources. There are regional powers who want to create buffer zones. There is religious sectarian issues. And as the speaker today is going to talk about, there is also corruption, which is the, the most important element for being able to achieve uh, a negotiated peace. Because when people are corrupt, it's very difficult to deal with them. The Armenian people in the Middle East, mostly in, in the past in Lebanon and today in Syria, have been positive neutral. What that means is that we as Armenians, we don't believe that the uh, violence is the solution to this problem. There has to be a negotiated settlement, some political. So this is the position of the Armenian community. Some of the Arab students who were planning to come, they were asking me about this issue, and I had a lengthy discussion with them over the phone. You know, we tend to be with, with Assad, so to speak, but that's because he's the only person there who's defending minorities today. We all have seen what happens when the others come uh, and what they do to Christians. So it's not that we have a choice in this map. You know, we try to find security. They understand that. Uh, coming up to this subject, um, the main speaker today, the only speaker today, will be Sarah Lee Whitson. Um, Sarah is a uh, executive director, is the executive director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division. And that office oversees the work of the division in 19 countries, with the staff located in 10 countries. She has led dozens of advocacy and investigative missions throughout the region, focusing on issues around conflict, accountability, legal reform, migrant workers, and political rights. She has published widely on human rights issues in the Middle East, in international and regional media, including the New York Times, Foreign Policy, the Los Angeles Times, and CNN. She appears regularly on Al Jazeera, BBC, NPR, and CNN. Before joining Human Rights Watch, Whitson worked in New York for Goldman Sachs and Company, and clearly Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton. She graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, and Harvard Law School. Ms. Whitson is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She speaks Armenian and Arabic, in addition to English, of course. 
Miss Whitson is also one of the success stories of Southern California's Armenian schools, in particular Alex Pilibos, as she's a graduate of that school. There will be a chance later on to ask questions to Sarah Lee. So without further delay, let me introduce our speaker. for this invitation to speak today about the human rights situation in the Middle East. It's such a wonderful opportunity to speak before an Armenian audience um, and to see so many of my old friends here. Um, it's an honor that you're here to listen to me, especially my friends who know me. That's particularly, uh, uh, means a lot to me. So thank you for coming uh, to, to hear what uh, I have to say. Um, I know the Middle East uh, is a part of the world to which many, if not most, of the Armenian community feels deeply attached. We have been part of the history, culture, art, architecture, music, politics, and society of the Middle East for thousands of years. Our shared Ottoman experience has given us much in common with the peoples of this region. And it was in the Middle East, as Jan just noted, where most Armenians found refuge and protection when we fled the genocide in 1915. Many of you here today have families who have been refugeed many times over, trapped in the wars of the region. My own family, those who survived the genocide, were first refugeed from Dikhanagev and Yudun to Syria, Palestine, and Lebanon in 1915. They were then forced to flee from Palestine during the 1948 war that created Israel, then suffered Black September in Jordan in 1970 when my grandmother and uncle were killed. Next, the civil war in Lebanon in 1975 where they abandoned their business and home to save their lives. And now, the war in Syria where several of my relatives have stubbornly remained. The Armenian community has also been victimized in Iraq, Egypt, Kuwait, and even Libya. Everywhere I travel in the region, I meet and hear about Armenians struggling to survive. Is there anyone in this audience whose family has not been affected? And so we follow what happens in the Middle East with great interest and deep understanding. There is turbulence the world over, but these are particularly dark days in the Middle East, which continues to dominate the headlines. I will not sugarcoat the reality. Man-made misery afflicts the region, as the Arab uprisings have degenerated into an Arab catastrophe of violence, chaos, and destruction. There are full-out wars in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen involving 13 Arab countries, over 50 years of on and off war in occupied Palestine, and a virtually secret war in Egypt's Sinai. While the plight of Syrian refugees has dominated the headlines in the last few weeks, there is unparalleled suffering for tens of millions of Arabs, Kurds, Shiite, Sunni, Christians, Turkmen, Yazidi, Shabak, Alawi, Tawana. The rich list of the peoples in this region is long, but sadly shrinking. I want to walk you through a number of areas that have been a focus of my work and a focus of global attention. Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Because I think they highlight the most important human rights issues and human rights failings that affect us not just as Armenians, but as Americans. Because as Americans, we have a particular responsibility to speak out against the wrongs of our own government, which contribute to the misery of so many millions in the Middle East by arming and supporting abusive governments there. And we must take note when the policies of our own government serve not to defeat extremism and abuse, but to encourage support for it. The destruction of the democratic movement in Egypt has been the greatest disappointment, because Egypt is where we had the most hope. Just a few years ago, the entire world cheered on men and women, young and old, who thronged the streets of Cairo, Alexandria, and Aswan, who championed freedom, whose righteousness and courage no one could dispute. 
These people stood up and took bullets for the principles we all cherish, justice, dignity, and rights. They are the heroes of our age. Just as the images of Tiananmen Square came to stand for resistance against oppression in the late 20th century, so the images of demonstrators resisting the camelback thugs attacking them at Tahrir Square stand for the stubborn, enduring struggle for freedom from tyranny in this century. We believe Egypt, the largest Arab country, would break through the region's ossified dictatorships and monarchies by navigating a peaceful transition to democracy, electing a president in free elections for the first time in its history. That democracy, the democracy that was led by President Mohamed Morsi, was lost to a preening, thuggish general, Abdul Fattah el-Sisi, who orchestrated a counter-revolutionary coup and crushed those who resisted, including a sit-in of over 100,000 people at al Rabah and Nafa squares. In some of the most personally difficult work in which I've been involved, Human Rights Watch documented how Egyptian military leaders planned and executed a massacre of their own citizens in broad daylight, killing over a thousand protesters in a single day of the world's largest mass killing of protesters. We gather testimonies of over 200 victims, witnesses, doctors, and journalists, showing story by story, picture by picture, hour by hour, and minute by minute what happened that day. I wanted to show you a brief film about our massacre to get a sense of the work that Human Rights Watch does, but unfortunately our sound is not working. Following the coup, the Sisi administration labeled all of the Muslim Brotherhood as terrorists, and the same as ISIS using this to justify jiggling up to 30,000 Egyptians on a bogus laundry list of charges and total impunity for abusive security forces, not just for the mass killings in Rabah, but during the, during the uprising as well, with a government-appointed fact-finding commission that found no one responsible. Today, Egyptian courts have acquitted Mubarak and his security forces of killing hundreds, while sentencing President Morsi and over a thousand Muslim brothers to death. Reflecting the depth of depravity towards this murder, the government erected a statue in Rabah Square to honor its murderous police and renamed the square after recently slain Mohammed Ibrahim, one of the chief architects of the massacre. The destruction of democracy in Egypt has been, by, has been portrayed by Egypt's generals as a necessary measure to counter Islamists and feed into Western fears, Armenian fears as well, about political Islam. But Egypt's generals have gone well beyond attacking Islamists. Leftists, secular activists, the LGBT community, even atheists, have all been caught up in the government's snares, prosecuted, jailed, or worse, killed. And there has been a wide-scale shuttering of civil society with journalists and activists arrested and sentenced, many others fleeing the country. Human Rights Watch was forced to close our own office in Cairo, facing serious threats to our staff there. Last year, the government found fit to deport me and my boss from the country when we arrived to release our report on the Rabal massacre. Despite this terrible record and past promises by President Obama to no longer stand with dictators, Washington has resumed military aid to Cairo. The West is pumping its business ties with the country, and no one has shown much appetite for challenging the military government's abuses. This is not only a disaster for Egyptians' hopes of a democratic future, it sends an appalling message to the region. There is no room for political Islam, no space for Islamists and peaceful democratic structures, and it is a perfect recruiting tool for groups like ISIS. While Egypt is the greatest disappointment, Syria's ongoing war, with more than 200,000 dead and 10 million refugees and internally displaced, is no doubt the greatest disaster of the region. It is also the greatest shame of the international community in its collective failure to protect people from mass slaughter in the 21st century, as it failed in the century before in a history that leaves Armenians know all too well. Our researchers have worked in Syria's war zones and killing fields to document the horrors inflicted on the Syrian people 
with daily barrel bombs, missiles, mortars, artillery, and even chemical weapons. We've also documented the abuses of armed groups, including attacks on civilians in Damascus and massacres of Alawis in the Latakia area. This war has destroyed not only human lives, but thousands of years of history, monuments, mosques, and churches, including the 15th century Armenian church in which I was baptized in Aleppo. Some in the Armenian community see in Assad a protector for the Armenians and Christians in the country. I take no comfort in the protection offered by mass murder. The UN Security Council, blocked most significantly by Russia and China, has been able to do little. Most significantly, it has managed to ensure some agreement on cross-border aid to opposition-held areas, which Human Rights Watch pushed very hard for, and the importance of which we can't minimize. It now looks likely that a Russian veto threat will stymie efforts to pass a resolution promising to sanction the Syrian government if the grotesque barrel bombs in civilian areas continue. It is rightly disturbing that after years of sitting on its hands in the face of the Syrian government's massive human rights abuses, it is only the appearance of ISIS that led Western nations to intervene in Syria, and then only against ISIS. Now we even see Russian, Syrian, American, and Turkish forces joined in attacks against ISIS. Yet it is ISIS's main selling point that they are the only ones ready, willing, and able to take on Assad. If what we want is peace and security for the people of Syria, then at minimum the international community should continue to press aggressively for a peace process, a referral of Syria to the International Criminal Court, an arms embargo, and sanctions against the worst offenders as it is trying to defeat ISIS. Without such a comprehensive approach, Syrians will have neither peace nor security, and the refugee flows out of the country will continue. The rise of ISIS started in Syria, of course, but its fantastic takeover of such a large swath of Iraqi territory, starting with the dramatic conquest of Mosul and the evaporation of Iraqi security forces, is a capture world attention last year. It didn't, in reality, happen overnight. We must first and foremost recall the US-led Iraq war, which displaced the dictator but brought occupation, death, and destruction to Iraq, with over a million dead due to the war. We must remember Abu Ghraib and other detention centers where Americans imprisoned and tortured Iraqis, many of whom became radicalized, including the leader of ISIS today, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. We must remember the highly sectarian government of Nuri al-Maliki that the United States installed that divided the nation into Sunni and Shia warring camps and marks the main current division in the country. Human Rights Watch has been on the ground in Iraq for many years, documenting the terrible abuses of Maliki's government against the Sunni population, including arbitrary mass arrests and torture, indiscriminate bombardment and political exclusion, warning that it would lead to war. By early 2014, well before ISIS's appearance, 500,000 Sunnis had been displaced by the fighting. These are the conditions that galvanize the support for extremist groups in Sunni areas, which coalesced into ISIS and spawned the terror crisis in the country today. Many Sunnis now under ISIS control have accepted their rule as the lesser of two evils. ISIS has carried out the most shocking abuses, from mass killings, kidnappings, and targeted attacks against religious and ethnic minorities, including horrifying forced marriages and forced conversions. For many of us, the attacks targeting Yazidi women have in particular brought painful echoes of the way in which Turks enslaved and forcibly married thousands of Armenian women a century ago. Yet the single-minded global attention on defeating ISIS, spearheaded by the anti-ISIS coalition, is short-sighted and destined to fail Iraq civilians if it is not coupled with equal attention to the abuses carried out now by Iraqi government security forces and government-backed, armed, and funded Shia militias who are the main fighting force in the country today. The government is not in control of these militias. And the weapons the United States sends to the Iraqi government are effectively sent to these militias. These militias have carried out heinous and shocking abuses that compete pretty well with ISIS's, 
mass killings, including beheadings, throwing prisoners accused of crimes like homosexuality off the buildings, dragging prisoners tied to trucks through streets, and burning and looting Sunni villages liberated by US airstrikes from ISIS. It is an extremely dangerous operating environment. Our researcher and research assistant, like a number of journalists, face serious death threats, leading us to evacuate them and their families from the country. The abuses of these Shia militias outnumber their gains, and it has been difficult for Sunni civilians to know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Over one year into the airstrikes campaign, with over 20,000 sorties and many of the world's superpowers fighting in the anti-ISIS coalition, they have managed to recapture less than 5% of the land held by ISIS, whose troops by all accounts number less than 30,000 men. We must be honest in our assessment that this campaign is failing from a military perspective. The US, our government, needs to reconsider its strategy, not just to ensure that its own airstrikes don't lead to militia abuses, but to press the Iraqi government for urgent political reforms as hard as it's pressing to defeat ISIS. Without a major overhaul of Iraq's justice system, revisions of unjust laws, and centralization of an accountability for militia groups, the war against ISIS will fail strategically and politically. I want to say a few words about the anti-ISIS coalition and the so-called war against Islamist extremism, which General Allen was recently noting on the one-year anniversary uh, uh, press release that the State Department put out just a few years, a few days ago. I don't know how many more of those anniversary press releases we expect to see. The similarities between Saudi Arabia's extremism and ISIS and Al-Qaeda are in fact quite striking. They make the Western alliance with Saudi Arabia as part of the anti-ISIS coalition pretty absurd if the goal is to quash extremism. In many ways, ISIS and Al-Qaeda model the very same behavior that Saudi Arabia champions in the name of Islam as the custodian of the two holy mosques. Beheadings as a vehicle to challenge Catholics and heretics? Saudi Arabia leads the way, with more beheadings than ISIS or any other country in the world. This year looking to surpass prior records, mostly for drug offenders. There are even people sentenced to death for sorcery and witchcraft in Saudi Arabia. Violence against journalists or critics who offend Islam? Saudi again leads the way, with journalists and bloggers not only jailed, but subjected to physical violence by way of lashings. So is it any surprise that ISIS and Al-Qaeda think this is appropriate behavior to defend Islam if the custodian of Islam does the same? And so who in the Middle East can take seriously that the war in Iraq is really a war against Islamist extremism? This is not the work we hoped we'd be doing when the Arab uprisings began. When we saw the arc of history bending toward justice before our eyes, our goals were to build rights-respecting institutions. Instead, murderous governments kill and jail courageous activists, journalists, and political opponents. We are far from the full measure of justice, legal and judicial accountability, with perpetrators punished and victims compensated. But we do this work, I do this work, of documenting these crimes, knowing that there is also justice and power and value in standing with victims, listening and giving voice to their experiences, and telling the truth. This happened, and it was wrong, and we need to make it right. And so our work today captures the crimes around us so we can guard history and make denial impossible. Armenians know how important it is to make denial impossible. Kundera said, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. As an Iraqi father of a young man murdered by militia members simply pleaded, showing me a photo of his son at a soccer game, I want it written. I want the world to know. He was just a boy. He was my son. As Armenians, we understand how important this is. 
The testimonies of victims, witnesses, and perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide are largely all that we have left about what happened to our people a century ago. And we have never stopped remembering and reminding the world about this great injustice. This April, I went to Istanbul, where I joined thousands of Turks and Armenians to commemorate the centennial of the Armenian Genocide with a group of Armenian, Turkish, and American academics, lawyers, writers, and activists, including some of the audience here today, we founded a group called Project 2015 to bring Armenians from around the world to Turkey for the centennial, to return to the scene of this horrific crime, to bury our dead at last in lands from which we have been expelled, and to celebrate our survival against the odds. 100 years have passed, but there we stood near Taksim Square from 20 countries holding placards, flowers, and pictures of our loved ones, urging the government to come to terms with the country's bloody history. Alongside us, shoulder to shoulder, were many thousands of Turkish citizens ready to recognize the past, however painful. Our presence together, however small, stood for the very large principle that the craving for justice endures, carries through generations, crosses national boundaries, and gives us purpose and hope. I think the most important conversation we need to be having as Armenians is with Turkish civil society. The recent electoral gains of the HTP are a tremendously important breakthrough and opening, effectively the first time that 14% of the Turkish government officially recognizes the Armenian Genocide. We must now spend as much energy building ties with progressive voices in Turkey that will be the engines for change there as we do lobby international governments. The title of my talk is A Century of Hope, even in these dark days. I and so many of my fellow activists focused on the Middle East take strength from advances we see, not just in medicine, science, and technology, but in human rights advances around the world. Civil rights for the LGBT community in the United States, the vastly expanded freedom and democracy in Latin America and Eastern Europe, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the establishment of the International Criminal Court and the justices that has served in Rwanda and Bosnia, and the arms treaties on landmines and cluster munitions that have discredited these evil weapons and stigmatized those who still use them. We know that the Middle East will also have its moment for freedom one day, though it will take longer and cost more than we hoped, because the human instinct against tyranny demands it. Today, we find power in the unknown future. We rely on our political and moral will to create new horizons of freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. There was a lot of information. She covered quite a number of countries in the Middle East. You've got your work cut for you. It's the most volatile region in the world. Um, a lot of challenges, a lot of things to think about. I think the majority of us come from the Middle East, if not all of us, in one, from one country or another, whether it's Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, uh, Jordan. Uh, we've been to many of the other countries in the region. I am sure you all have questions, uh, but I want to kick off one question myself, sir, if you allow. Wouldn't have the status quo in the Middle East before the Arab Spring experiment would have led to less human rights abuses? I'm not sure I understood your question. Would have the status quo in the Middle East prior to the Arab Spring resulted in less human rights abuses than the ones we see today? Um, not really, because the, the main parties carrying out human rights abuses are the same governments that existed before the Arab uprisings. So the, the, the uh, government of Egypt, uh, uh, the governments uh, throughout the Gulf, uh, uh, th these are all governments other than Tunisia that basically suppressed the Arab uprisings. So the Arab uprisings failed because they could not dislodge 
um, these very strong built-in states uh, that made it impossible to replace democracy. Do you agree it was an experiment? Every so social history, the world is an experiment every day. There's, there's, uh, you know, if you look at the Egyptian revolution, uh, it was the, the, the least bloody revolution um, that I've seen or know about. Tunisia, one of the least bloody revolutions ever. If you compare it to the Russian revolution or the Chinese revolution or the European revolutions, I think what was remarkable about the Arab uprisings uh, is uh, across the region. Uh, how, in fact, most of them were relatively bloodless revolutions. Thank you. Uh, let, I, I wish to open the floor for questions, and please feel free to speak your mind candidly. We're here for an open forum, and uh, I'll start with the first question, please. atrocities in places um, like the Halloween village near Latakia. Um, we were the only organization to immediately go in and document the massacre of Alawis by armed groups. Um, we investigated what happened in Kassab, for example. I mean, we've done numerous reports on, uh, on indiscriminate attacks, suicide bombings in Damascus by armed groups. Um, so first of all, as a matter of fact, I think it's not correct your claim um, that human rights organizations or my human rights organization only looks at the abuses of Assad. So that's an easy question. And I think we can fairly put that aside. And I welcome you to go to our website and actually read the reports we've done on armed groups in Syria and the abuses they've committed. Um, so you might have a little more information if you do that. Um, second of all, uh, and this comes up always in Israel and Palestine, where people who are defenders of the Israeli government in any talk I give will immediately say, how come you never talk about the abuses of Hamas? And how come you never talk about the uh, Palestinian rockets and the steroids and da, da, da. And of course, I say the same answer I just gave you, which is, it's not true. We always document abuses uh, of uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and any uh, 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 deliberate or indiscriminate attacks on civilians that are aimed uh, towards Israel or often, some, most often, 
aimed towards the civilian population in Gaza or Lebanon and so forth. Um, but there's a question of scale. There's a question of scale that I think we cannot be blind to. First of all, the vast majority of those killed in Syria have been killed by Syrian government security forces. So you can shake your head no, but the work that we do on the ground is to actually investigate the facts. And the facts show us that even well before the armed uprising in Syria, Assad fired live ammunition into protests against him. Civilians were protesting, demanding political reform in Syria, and Assad security forces responded by firing live ammunition at demonstrations. This is well documented. Please don't shake your head no when I'm speaking. It's actually a little bit rude. So I didn't, so please just let me communicate without feeling like I'm being rejected before the words have actually left my mouth, right? I mean, okay, so, but, and, and I think it's, it's, not, it's to be so partisan as to excuse massacres that not just Human Rights Watch, but countless human rights organizations, international organizations have documented with the testimonies of witnesses, with videos, with satellites, and so forth, is just wrong. You can say, I support Assad, even though he's carried out these terrible abuses, because this is my political agenda. You're entitled to have a hold that political position. I may not agree with it. But as a matter of fact, we can't start by denying the facts. And the facts are that Assad has dropped barrel bombs in civilian areas. Assad's forces attacked 12 bakeries in the course of two days in Aleppo. Our researchers were on the ground very close to these bombing attacks. These were deliberate attacks on bakeries. Assad has deliberately bombarded medical centers, hospitals, clinics in opposition-held areas. Okay? These are the facts. In his mind, he may feel he's justified doing whatever it takes to keep himself in power. Okay? But there is such a thing called laws of war. And the laws of war say you can't drop bombs on civilian areas. You can't detonate chemical weapons ever. Not against civilians, not against the military. Uh, you can't fire artillery and mortar on residential housing where people live. If you do, it's a war crime. Okay? And the facts are there very plainly to see that Assad is fighting a very ugly war. Okay? That's, those are the facts, okay? And one last point, the notion that Assad was elected, I mean, that really is a, is a, is a travesty of the word election, okay? Assad promised to do reforms, but in the 10 years he was in power, he didn't make any reforms. What he did was, he jailed all of the people who actually came up with something called the Damascus Spring to, the, to, to, to say, here are the political reforms we'd like to see now that you're the new president. He put them all in jail. Okay. These are people we, lawyers, secular activists, women's rights activists, they've all been in jail. Not to mention the brutal torture that we documented in serious prisons. Okay. Of course, he won an election with 98% of the vote, the same way that Mubarak and Sisi win an election with 98% of the vote. It's very easy to win an election when anyone who might be in the opposition is dead or in jail. That's not a real election. That's called an unfair and unfree sham election. So throwing out the notion that he was elected is some kind of a serious concept. I mean, it's just not. Next question. Thank you for in, in respect to others, so that we can allow more time for others, there is a reception outside where we can talk one-on-one uh, -on -one if, if you have more questions. No, no, but if there are other questions, I just have to respond. Well, okay. it's, it's, this is a... Excuse me? I'm not interested in Well, this is... Let me, let me interject for a second. This is a lecture where, where we have a respected speaker, and she is here to deliver her views. We, each and every, every one of us, have their views, and we should respect one another if we are here to 
in an open forum. As such, uh, let's let's stick to one one or two questions max, so that I'm sure many of us have questions. As well as let us not actually comment on one another's question because the questions are directed towards our speaker. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take uh, Reverend Vajek Mekjan's uh, question to Sarah. Vajek is from Aleppo, by the way. Yeah. Yes. I, I arrived five years ago. I grew up there and. Um, my question has two parts, only two distinct. First, uh, within all the blacklists that you spoke about, that they are all being documented, uh, I guess maybe we should hear something more about Turkey. That uh, something that they've done 100 years ago, uh, are we that much naive not to speak about the role of Turkey in the current situation, knowing all from pictures? I'm not an expert. I have no clue to find, but just looking into the pictures of northern Syria uh, became free from the Assad regime. I see all the Dagestanis, Chechens, and everyone coming and fighting out of great love for Syrian people, or maybe. So knowing that all these people are coming from there, where does Turkey fall within the watch of the human rights? But for second thing, what would have been the best scenario uh, if um, let's say the Muslim Brotherhood, they stayed under regime in Egypt. I mean, what would have become with Egypt and the entire region if they were there 100%? Thank you. Um, in the first question, I should note my comments the focus on Turkey because just by so technically speaking, Turkey is not part of the Middle East and North African region. So another part of Human Rights Watch works on, and, and, is, and our researchers based in Istanbul, on the abuses inside Turkey now, which of course, as I'm sure you know, are principally against the Kurdish minority, including you know, mass arrests that are now ongoing, uh, as Erdogan has basically resurrected the war against the Kurds in order to politically defeat the HDP. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is the reason we're seeing this conflagration. Um, that being said, um, with respect to the funneling of weapons uh, to armed groups in Syria, including, as you rightly note, uh, people who come from Chechnya, Afghanistan, Tunisia. Tunisia is the number one supplier of foreign armed fighters to Syria, shockingly enough. Um, I see the responsibility uh, as shared uh, by several governments. Certainly, Turkey provided the path through which these armed groups have crossed into uh, Syria. Uh, and they do bear a responsibility for allowing uh, these sorts of uh, armed elements, uh, destructive elements, extremist elements, to enter uh, into Syria to wreak havoc and terror as they have done. Um, but I think that that responsibility is shared uh, by governments like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE, uh, who have armed uh, these uh, uh, foreign fighters, as well as extremist groups inside Syria. Let's not pretend they're all foreigners and Salah Sharia, Nusra, and so forth, they also have bases inside the country made up of Syrians who, for, you know, many can speculate as to why they join these extremist groups, but are, you know, the principal fighters of these extremist groups. Um, uh, but also, um, they're not alone either, right? Because other foreign fighters include Lebanese fighters who've come from, from, you know, from, from Hezbollah to support the Syrian government, the Iranian government has also sent in advisors. So there is a lot of blame to go around in terms of the foreign nefarious meddling in Syria, um, the brunt of which is being borne by Syrian civilians, by Syrian children. There's a lot of blame to go around, and certainly Turkey shares it. Um, with respect to the second question about the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, there is a great boogeyman in the minds of the West about the Muslim Brotherhood, or about political Islam. And it's always, you know, uh, when we talk about the Morsi government, um, and I've spent a lot of time talking about the Morsi government with many people, when I say, what is it that the Morsi government did wrong? Did they pass laws against women? Did they close down Christian churches? Uh, did they, I, I don't know, uh, implement Islamic Sharia in an extreme way? What is it that they did, right? And the answer is nothing. Okay, so if anybody has any evidence of what it is the Muslim Brotherhood 
did, I'd love to hear it because I've been speaking to Egyptian scholars and, and journalists and activists for a long time. There was a lot of fear of what they might do. There was draft legislation proposed by some of the extremist elements inside the Muslim Brotherhood. They did propose to reduce the uh, marriage age uh, for children, for example. That bill never went anywhere. They did propose to institute the niqab, uh, rather the, the, uh, the hijab, for television broadcasters on state television. That legislation didn't go anywhere. Right? So there was a lot of fear about what might happen. They're not the only Islamist government in the world. Turkey has an Islamist government. It is a version of the Muslim Brotherhood, in a sense, as in a, a group that believes in political Islam. Um, and the sky hasn't fallen, right? It's a functioning uh, you know, democracy that's slowly slipping away from being a democracy. I'll grant you that. But nevertheless, it's a, it's, 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 it's a government with an Islamist political leaning. And what we have to grapple with in the West is that the people in the region have to be able to choose their leaders, and we have to demand from those leaders that they respect the rights of minorities and women and religious groups and so forth. But I also never understand why those who are so afraid about what the Muslim Brotherhood might do in the future have never once had any problem with the Islamist extremism of the Saudi Arabian government, which is far to the right of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, where there's not a single church, there's not a single Shia mosque, even though 14% of the population is Shia, where there's absolutely no religious freedom, where women can't even get married without the permission of uh, their male guardian, where women cannot appear outside um, without, not, uh, without wearing the, the, the full um, uh, black clothing and, and hijab. How come? How come that doesn't bother anybody? But the minute it's political Islam that's elected by the people, that's a democratic government, everybody's worried about what political Islam might do? I think there's a bit of an inconsistency there. Well, be before I go to the next question, uh, I tend to forget sometimes. Uh, Sarah, I don't want to put you under the spot right here, but uh, I'm in finance. I want to know uh, who funds your organization. Is it a government? Is it other private organizations? Are they? Is it Wall Street? Is it who, who funds your organization? And who are the three uh, organizations or governments that actually take action based on your findings? Um. So uh, uh, Human Rights Watch is a non-governmental organization, an independent organization, a non-profit organization, um, which means we don't take money from any government or governmental agency in the world. So our source uh, comes from private donations. People like you and me um, who write checks to Human Rights Watch. And so we do fundraising, we have annual dinners. I'd love it if everybody comes to our annual dinner in Los Angeles, which is in November. Um, and. Um, there are some who are wealthier than others who write bigger checks, but you know we get you know hundred dollar checks from my in laws, and we get million dollar checks from very rich people. So it's it's a it's a, a mix. The vast majority of our donors are in the United States and Western Europe. Um, I've spent the last ten years trying to raise our money from the region because I think that people from the region have to invest in human rights if they want to see progress in the region and. I think we've had a little bit of success in that regard. There are actually real progressive human rights believing people uh, uh, in, in the region. Um, but you know, just as, as a Western-based organization, the vast, vast majority of our money comes from um, private donors, individual donors in the um, uh, US and Europe. And that's just the That's a good question. Um, well, I think that uh, I know uh, we meet with government officials, uh, government representatives, armed groups, armed group representatives, civil society members uh, all the time. And so when we issue a report, we make recommendations, uh, oftentimes governments will meet with us. Um, some governments uh, won't meet with us, like Assad's government or the Iranian government or um, 
I'm trying to think of a somewhat contra to them, to give you an example, but it's not just them. Um, the Emirati government won't meet with us. Um, I'm just thinking of the Middle East here. Um, policymakers, foreign governments, because oftentimes our recommendations are not just to the government, but they are also to governments, you know, for example, we say to the US, stop funding, stop giving Egypt military weapons. We say to the US government, stop giving Israel uh, weapons that it's using to carry out abuses. We say to the Iranian government, stop giving Assad weapons to carry out abuses. And so we also meet with uh, governments um, who, you know, who have an interest. We rely on the media uh, a great deal to publicize our reports. And that is the, the theory uh, of, of the model for change, which is if you expose the abuse, um, you can shame the government into changing its behavior. That that's rarely happens in practice, you know. Most of the time, governments want to continue their abuses because it means maintaining themselves in power. Um, but oftentimes, we do see some change. We do see some progress. Thank you. I'm going to take more questions. Please. Hi. Uh, Sarah, it was wonderful to meet you in Istanbul. My wife and I were uh, really glad to participate in Project 2015. Uh, and in your talk, uh, there was a lot of um, terrible things that, you, uh, that are happening around the world. And then you did uh, mention your experience also in, uh, in uh, Istanbul. And I was wondering, you talked about the importance of building uh, and the potential for building relationships with progressive civil society groups that do recognize the Armenian genocide. So I was wondering, what are some specific ways that that might happen like, between LA and Right. I mean, the, the, the challenge that we have as Armenians, the particular challenge we have as Armenians is that we're so dispersed, right? We're so far away. And so how do we reestablish ties with our uh, Ottoman heritage? How do we reconnect with those lands? Um, it's hard enough to connect with Armenia, you know, and, 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 and the homeland uh, there. Um, but if it means something to us, then we have to make that effort and we have to make that connection. Um, you met some of the uh, civil society groups uh, like Rude, like the Human Rights Association that have for many years before it was hip <laughs> to talk about the Armenian Genocide, started talking about the Armenian Genocide. Um, so many scholars, so many journalists in the country write openly now about the genocide. But I think we have to also build ties with the political party, the HDP. Um, the country's in crisis now with the regime war against the, the, the Kurds, and so what happens if there's a new election and whether they maintain their over 10% threshold remains to be seen. Um, but given that Armenian organizations are spending time on genocide recognition, I would hope that some of that resource and some of that energy and some of that effort can be directed towards building ties with Turkish civil society. Because in the end, that's where this has to happen. It's just not going to make a difference if the U.S. recognizes ultimately, right? I mean, of course, it's very important. It's a building block. It's next step and so forth. We have to push Turkish civil society to take this next step. And it does happen, right? I mean, we've seen Japan come to terms with its past. We've seen so many countries come to terms with their past. Uh, Belgium come, came to terms with what it did in the Congo, et cetera, 100 years later. And this is an opening that's, that, that, that hasn't happened in 100 years. When 14% of the Turkish government, their official position is, we recognize the Armenian genocide, we want to make amends. Uh, I know a lot of you are here um, really interested to know the fate of our brethren inside Syria. What will their uh, survival look like? What is the uh, outcome of many thousands, and there are estimates that say there are more than 50,000 refugees, Armenian, Syrian Armenian refugees in Lebanon, Syria, uh, uh, Armenia, some are in, on their way to Europe, and today uh, we got a call from a refugee family in Los Angeles which does not have money to purchase a refrigerator in this heat, and uh, many of us are concerned about this. If there are questions, uh, if I may, the next question be about Syrian Armenians, if you may. Well, before that question, I'd like to ask a basic question. 
the, the, um, thank you for your presentation. You talked about crimes of everyone except the USA in the Middle East. Why? Uh, all of my talk was about how the U.S. is supporting abuse of governments in the region, in fact. And that was why I focused on Egypt, Iraq, and Syria. You didn't say anything about destruction of Iraq, Libya, who destroyed Iraq? Well, I was only focused my talk, so that I don't keep you here for three hours, on three countries, Iraq, <coughs> uh, uh, Egypt, um, and Syria. And I like, very, you know, happy to give you a copy of my talk, but very specifically talked about the role of the U.S. in arming and supporting the use of governments there. And that's a crime, isn't it? Crime against humanity, destroying yeah, and occupying countries? It's a very specific term in law, in international law, um, and it's uh, codified in something called the Rome Statute, um, which is the basis for the International Criminal Court. It lists certain things that are crimes against humanity, for example, genocide. Um, the other is um, widespread and systematic killings of civilians, that's a crime against humanity. The transfer of population to occupied territory, also known as the settlements, um, that's a crime against humanity. So there's very specific crimes. So arming a government is not a crime against humanity. Destroying a country is not against humanity. Again, there are very specific crimes that are listed, elements, you know. So, that are, that are so the USA is not a criminal country. Under which standard are you? I mean, I can talk about a certain law. I mean, this, is the US policy in the Middle East a big problem? Did the US, war, let me just finish. Did the US war in Iraq lead to the deaths of a million Iraqis? Yes, I mentioned that. So? So why are you blaming others about it, my dear lady? I am surprised. This can go for a long time. Yes. I think there's an important question about Egypt. You said that they are worried uh, of what might uh, the brothers could do, do rather than what they did. It's a fact that the, the Muslim Islamic people were, were the brotherhood all extremists. They have burned Egyptian Christian churches. They have massacred. They have killed them. Not on one occasion, on several occasions. Would you comment on Yes. So, just to be clear, when we talk about human rights abuses, um, only governments have human rights obligations under human rights law. So, if a government kills somebody, it might be a human rights abuse. Police officers kill people sometimes, and they're justified in doing so, or they may argue that they're justified in doing so. Um, but if they massacre a thousand people, then they have violated the human rights of the population. If a criminal kills somebody, that's not a human rights violation. Okay? That's human rights law. Human rights law binds governments, and sometimes binds armed groups. Okay? So if criminals go and burn down churches in Cairo, as has happened, and by the way, this has been happening since well before uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's brief administration in Egypt, but under Mubarak, um, there was a Christmas Day attack against Christians, there were numerous attacks uh, on, uh, in Asut against Christians, I mean, we documented these, because our focus was the Mubarak government's failure to investigate and prosecute attacks against Christians in Egypt. We documented the Mubarak government's failure to allow Christians to renovate churches. Right? That, those are the kinds of abuses that we documented. And sadly, um, the abuses that have taken place with impunity against Christians in Egypt haven't happened only, or didn't happen only, or even more numerically uh, under the brief period of the Morsi administration. The famous Maspero massacre, uh, when Christian demonstrators were shot and killed by uh, uh, Egyptian security forces, that happened when the military was in charge before the Morsi administration came to power. So are there violent attacks against Christians in Egypt? Absolutely. Is the Muslim Brotherhood responsible for these, or the Muslim Brotherhood's government? Not any more or less than any Egyptian government administration, including the CC administration today. 
Let, let's give yes, let's let's give others a chance, and then if we have time, we'll come back to you. Uh, I'm going to take the lady first. Thank you. Syrian Armenians generally, I, I think there are probably organizations and people here who know far more about Syrian Armenians and what they want or don't want than I do. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think Syrian Armenians have spoken with their feet um, by leaving. So obviously there are at least 50,000 Syrian Armenians who don't want to stay. I know from my personal experience that there are some Syrian Armenians who don't want to leave, like my cousin and his wife and their two children. My aunt just went back to Aleppo two weeks ago. You know, there are things I don't understand, but I respect that people make their choices and that's where they're choosing to be. Yes. Um, Sarah, thank you so much again for your talk. And, um, my question is, what can we do as Americans here to support um, the Syrian refugees and not, you know, the Armenian Syrian refugees? Well, you know, this again is probably outside of my own expertise or knowledge, but I know there are many reputable, respectable, charitable organizations that are attempting to assist uh, Syrian refugees. The Syrian Armenian uh, Relief Fund uh, is trying to help Syrian Armenian refugees. Um, I know the Aleppo Compatriotic Charitable Organization is trying to help Aleppo Armenians as well as Armenians who come, Syrian Armenians who've gone to Armenia. Um, I'm sure there are people here who know far more about that. I, I recently posted on Facebook and sent out, uh, because someone was asking me the number, name of various uh, Syrian refugee organizations, many of whom are trying to provide education to Syrian children, um, medical relief, uh, uh, things like that. Awesome. You mentioned that you rely on the media for the broadcast and the reports, and we know that the media may Bias. To what extent you are satisfied or you think that they, what they present is not biased? You know, it, certainly the media is biased. I mean, I, I just had a very funny, uh, funny uh, experience, which you know, was a, a source of humor on Twitter. Um, and that is that the Iranian government's press TV headlined their news a couple of weeks ago with our press release on the uh, toll of the death penalty in Saudi Arabia. And we were, you know, exposing the fact that Saudi Arabia had broken its last year's record on beheading people, and the Iranian news agency was flashing this as a news story. Meanwhile, of course, Iran's death penalty is far worse than Saudi Arabia's. So we regularly have very partisan media that cherry picks our news. So when the Bush administration was trying to justify its war in Iraq, it used our report about Saddam's gassing of the Kurds. Uh, to justify uh, uh, its uh, uh, intervention there. Um, when we publish a report documenting abuses of armed groups in Syria, Russian TV prominently runs it and displays it. Um, and so this is a global phenomenon, this cherry picking of, of news that validates what you already believe. I believe this side is bad and this side is good, so I'm only going to focus on that side's bad and I'm going to ignore the, the information that doesn't fit my pre-existing narrative. Um, I, think in the, I think the other part of the media reality um, isn't so much a media problem as it is an audience problem, which is uh, we are in a, a reality news TV flash age, and our attention span is very limited, and we are oversaturated with news and information. And the only way the media can keep you engaged is by pumping new, sensational, shocking information in a digestible format. And that's why the ISIS beheadings of Jim Foley in an orange uh, uh, jumpsuit with ready-made video was international news for a long time. And, and there was this incredible obsession with ISIS because it was new, because it was shocking, and because it was video. So, you know, after a while, you barely hear about ISIS in Iraq now. 
very good. Right now it's the Syrian refugees because they're flooding into Europe. I promise you it won't last. Right? There will be some next story. Some, and so the media has a need to keep pumping out new information. And that's not always information that is you know, the complex, nuanced, challenging, political dynamic of a situation that is very hard for an audience to understand. I mean, you know, I, I, I would imagine that many people here are very confused about the war in Yemen. You know, it's a very complicated situation. Very hard to describe in a two or three minute news story. Sarah, as a follow-up, have, have you ever refused an invitation by a TV station? There, there, we have refused a certain Iranian uh, news channel uh, because they we documented how they were complicit in uh, in broadcasting forced confessions of Iranian political activists. What the Iranian government would do um, and has done, according to my own friends, um, is um, keep them in jail and ultimately tell them that you have to go on TV and confess. And the Iranian news channel would very clearly and obviously see that this person is forced to confess. Yeah. And they would broadcast it anyway. So in our perspective, they were then complicit themselves uh, in the abuse. Um, and so we have this one channel. We, we won't do interviews on their channel. John, can I take your question there? Let me ask a ladies' question in a different manner. Does your organization believe that minorities, Christians, are under threat in the Middle East that they should evacuate me. Is there a level of threat, a level of concern that causes, you know, for them to leave the area? Minorities are under threat in the region. Majorities are under threat in the region. No one is not under threat in the Middle East. When you look at the numbers, what do you think the greatest number of victims are? They're Sunni Arabs. They're the majority. Right? Where are they? Who are the vast majority of Syrian refugees? They're Sunnis. So I obviously have my personal area of concern, which has to do with Christian Armenians because of my personal ties and so forth. But I cannot pretend that that is the only problem in the region that we all have to be concerned about or focused on. I care just as much for a Sunni family uh, whose house has been burned down, uh, who, who has been terrorized, who's been murdered, as I do for a Christian family. You know, there is no one who is immune to the terror that is reigning in the Middle East right now. Does your organization work inside of Armenia? And if they do, uh, are there any human rights violations no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Human Rights Watch does work in Armenia. Uh, we have one researcher who covers Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. So you can imagine that the least of his attention goes to Armenia, a country of one to two million people, depending on who you ask, compared to Azerbaijan, which is you know, a highly abusive, repressive, country whose sphere of abuse extends beyond its borders. Um, and so our researcher's focus has been limited in Armenia. <clears throat> Nevertheless, and I have been lobbying for the Armenian community to support Human Rights Watch to have a full-time researcher in Armenia because I think it can help. I think it's productive. I think it's good for Armenia to have its abuses shown under the spotlight. And I don't cover Armenia, so my own detailed knowledge of the abuses there is very limited. Um, that being said, for example, we did just publish a report this year on the failure of the Armenian government to provide access, and this is a very narrow issue that is a special focus of ours, uh, to palliative care, uh, to pain-reducing medicines. There are, uh, you know, very strict drug use laws in Armenia that have the effect of denying cancer victims and other people with severe medical conditions access to morphine and other pain-reducing drugs. And so what we did is we documented this problem and how much suffering it causes to those who need palliative care with the very clear hopes that the government will revise its policies. 
on access to uh, these medicines and drugs uh, in, in the country. But I think, you know, as I, you know, it's, it's funny because I had the same reaction in Turkey, but, you know, I, 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 the last time I went to Armenia, I flew from Yemen to Armenia. And, you know, everyone's there is like, oh, things are so bad in Armenia. And I was like, things are so good in Armenia. You have no idea. This is a tough neighborhood. This is a tough region. We have a lot to be grateful for that people are not killing each other in Armenia the way they are everywhere else in the region. Um, once I watched an interview with Bashar al-Assad on Chavi Ruiz, and he said that the democracy in Western countries is not the same as the democracy, implementation of democracy in the Eastern countries, in the Middle East. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that's convenient uh, bullshit. <laughs> you know, we're human beings. Even a five-year-old child knows the difference between justice and injustice. In fact, sometimes five-year-olds have a much clearer understanding of what's fair and just and right than, than adults do. We've learned to make compromises with these things. As human beings, what our human rights are, are to have freedom of expression, freedom of association, to participate in the political process, to express our political choice, to have a government that rules by consent. And the way that consent is measured in modern society, east, west, north, south, is by voting. It's imperfect. Any democratic election has its flaws, including the American democratic system, which is run by money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, nobody's figured out a better way to know what people want and what it is that they're consenting to when they choose a government. So it's very convenient for us to say, I have jailed all the political activists in my country not just the Islamists, but the secularists and the communists and the leftists, not just the Sunni Muslims, but the Christians and the Alawites. Now, at the beginning of the uprisings, the uprisings against Assad were a very diverse crowd of people who wanted democratic change because that's what they saw happening in the region. Assad wasn't interested in that. I wish he had been interested in it. I wish Syria had a chance for democracy. I wish we could have avoided this bloodshed. I'll take uh, one or two more questions. Uh, I'm going to take one from the right and one from the left. So I'll start from the right. In the, word, in the words of uh, Supreme Court Justice William Douglas, he said, don't judge foreign people with American standards. We're doing that. That's where we become to democracy, mm -hmm. which in Middle East, to me, it's a ridiculous action of democracy. You, I need a, 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 you made a comparison between Morsi election and uh, Assad election. Assad family is ruling Syria for 40 years. Morsi ruled Egypt for one year. Yet their elections were all won by 99.9 .9 ridiculous numbers. To me, they're all, whichever word you use, the same elections in there, but there's no, in no way meets any standard. Mm -hmm. The democracy. So we're rushing into judgment about mercy. He would have done the same thing. In there, I think they have to let them alone, move our people out, and let them play their game. Well, I guess as a matter of fact, first I would correct you um, in saying that mercy did not win by 90% or 98% or anywhere near that. In fact, uh, Morsi's election against Shafiq, who was the, let's just call him the Bada candidate, and as one friend of mine just said, it's like choosing between cholera and typhoid, but I have to choose, um, was a very close election. And we didn't know who was going to win until the very end of the election. That's a miracle in the Middle East, not to know who's going to win. Okay? So there were international election observers in the country, it was a competitive political process. It was the first time in Egypt's history where you actually had a real competition between two candidates, which is a product of a runoff election, by the way. Um, and it was judged to be a fair and free election. This is not the case in Assad. I would like to know, sorry. There was so, a boycott in between. They didn't participate in the election. No. The anti-Mercy people. 
No, they no. There was there was there was a boycott in the constitution drafting process that took place after the election. It had nothing to do with the election itself. So I think again, as a matter of fact, it's wrong. You know, I guess on the second point, you're sort of making a metaphysical, philosophical point, which is yes, we're all humans, but some of us are more human than others. Some humans deserve democracy and freedom, and some don't because they're just not good enough. They can't handle it. They're lesser humans. They only should get tyranny. They should only get Assad, because they don't understand those people. So that's your political belief. My political belief is, I'm a human. And as a human, I have human rights. That's what human rights law is about. It's not West, it's not East, right? Everybody has human rights. That's what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is about. It's universal. And that declaration gives me rights as a human being. It doesn't matter whether I'm an Arab or a Norwegian or, or whatever. Right? So I believe that all humans deserve freedom. I believe all humans want freedom. And I believe that there will never be peace and freedom as long as there's tyranny. The human instinct will always be to fight against that tyranny. Because we're all human. Thank you for being here. And um, you ended your your message with hope, and that it might just take a little longer to get there. If you were talking to the leaders of youth groups here that want to get to that end, what are some baby steps you can, in your opinion, that would be helpful? Um, Take the long run, it's a long haul. You know, we may not see what we want to see in our lifetime. It took hundreds of years for democracy and freedom to, to, to come into play in, in uh, Europe. Um, it's still an aspiration for most people. We wanted to come overnight in the Arab countries. We wanted to come overnight. That's what Bush believed. You know, that's, that, that's what we all hope for. And, you know, I hope Tunisia lasts. I hope Tunisia's democracy lasts. There are terrorists who want to destroy the success in Tunisia. You know, I hope they lose and the Tunisian people win. Um, but I'm prepared to take the long view. You know, do, do I have any science for it? No. Um, but, you know, I guess I just believe in human instinct and, and the human instinct for freedom. Fundraising and sending money for refugees, uh, to aid refugee families, other than financial aid, if you had the leaders of all the youth groups here, what would you Well, uh, I mean, I guess the first thing I'd, be, I'd say is be informed. You know, I think there's a lot of misinformation. Dig in, know the facts. I find that people have a lot of political opinions with very little political facts. Um, or they cherry pick the facts that they like, and they bend the truth on the others. I would, I would advocate a real commitment and dedication to truth and facts. You know, it drives Armenians crazy when we hear the Turks say, oh, those Armenians, they were terrorists. It was a time of war. They were fighting against us. We didn't have a choice, right? And that, to hear Armenians say this to, to us now about us, that, oh, he's fighting terrorists. He doesn't have a choice. Come on, you know? Be loyal to the facts. Be loyal to the truth. That's 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 a really basic basic thing that's often missing. Well, I am sure you all agree that this was a very interesting forum. Although some of us some of us did not get their answers or agreed with Sarah, but that's that's the purpose. Is uh, today's lecture was about human rights from the Human Rights Watch perspective, and thank you all for uh, sharing your time and your questions. Uh, just a plug in here. Uh, we are we are not an organization with an organization which uh, organizes lectures or cultural events. We're an organization which collects money for Syria. And as such, tonight's event is a fundraiser, as well as our next event is a fundraiser, which is Hamaskai Sayat Nova and Ani Dance Group, and that's on October 18 at 6 p.m. And uh, you can buy your tickets on itsmyseat.com or, um, or you can call the number on this uh, flyer on your way out. 
please uh, en encourage staff and its efforts to help the Syrian Armenians who very desperately uh, need our help. And there are refreshments and some, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, wine and cheese outside, so please help yourself. And let's continue the discussion outside, if you may. Thank you again, Sarah, for...